Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to this latest MHA webinar, this time on international expansion. Uh, some of you will have seen our previous webinars on, on business development, and, and this is just the latest in that line. My name is Patrick King. Uh, I'll be dealing with uh, the first chunk of, of today's talk. Uh, I'm a tax partner based in Thames Valley. I'm joined as usual by James Kipping from our city office, and on this occasion also Jonathan Main uh, from the Northwest, uh, who will be talking about the VAT side of things. So if we can move on, James, please. And uh, what will be covered today? So I'm going to start off with uh, an introduction on what we're trying to achieve with today's webinar. Then we'll look at a few issues related to expansion overseas, branch versus entity, transfer pricing, which I'll explain also a bit about permanent establishment and extraction of profits. Then I'll hand over to Jonathan to talk about VAT, which is very important in cross-border operations. And then finally, James will finish up with matters related to employment, because obviously you might well be taking people on overseas um, if you're expanding in those areas. So if we can move on. So um, just by way of introduction first, um, your business has been growing in the UK, you're successful, you are selling more and more overseas. So you're minded to look to move to operating in some overseas location. There are a number of things you have to think about. Um, we've probably demonstrated in our various webinars in this series that tax is a little bit complicated. Uh, when you throw in the cross-border elements of that and overseas tax systems, uh, it needless to say gets even more complicated than, than we've been explaining so far. Uh, and, and I would just say it's absolutely vital, or at least extremely important, that you do look to get advice before you set up overseas. I've had a number of occasions in the past or over the years where clients, uh, new clients, uh, people contemplating becoming clients have come in talking about their desire to go overseas and wanting us to help them with that. Uh, and in response to the question, so where are you looking to go? I've had people say, well, I've got three employees in France, a couple in Germany, and I'm about to take someone from Italy. I just want to know where I should set up my business, uh, which then makes our hearts sink because they may well already have a taxable presence in any or all of those locations. They may or may not have been dealing with the local uh, employment taxes correctly. Uh, they almost certainly haven't got the VAT side right, uh, and they could have a whole load of issues before we've even started. So please, if you do nothing else, bear in mind, it is complicated. We can certainly help. Uh, I'll explain some of the areas where we can help. Uh, and if you get advice at the start from us, uh, in terms of where you wanna go, what sort of things you need to be aware of, we can then bring in the local advice, which is vital also uh, when you start setting up local operations. Uh, so I'll just, I'll just throw that in at the start. So, so what are the choices when, you, when, you, um, when you're looking to move overseas? Well, the first thing is, do you really need to have an entity overseas? Do you really need to have a taxable presence there? Uh, and a taxable presence can be achieved even without having a local company. So you have to be very careful of that. Um, before we even get as far as, uh, as a branch or an, entity, or an actual entity in the local area, um, you should look at whether you can carry on operating remotely. Can you just continue selling to that state without actually having presence there? And maybe you can't, maybe that's why we're now looking at it, but um, what do you actually need? Do you need to have a presence that gives you a taxable presence in that location? Or can you just simply have perhaps a warehouse which stores some goods to make the distribution of your product that much easier in the location? You can potentially do that without having what we would call a taxable presence there, i.e. having to pay tax in that location. Um, you may need a local employee to help with the sales. And again, you can potentially do that without having a taxable presence there, other than on the employment tax side, which James will talk about later. Um, but let's say you do want to go beyond that. You are now looking at setting something up there. You accept the fact that you will have uh, French or German or US taxes on profits related to your activity in that location. Uh, what might you be doing there? Well, we often have this comparison between all this tension between whether you want to set up as a branch or as a local entity. So what's the difference between the two? Well, a branch is just part of your existing UK company. It's just you are operating in France. Let's say you set up an office there or a factory or whatever it is. 
but you haven't got a French company at this stage, it's just part of your UK company. That has certain advantages, and I've got the pros and cons, or the obvious pros and cons up on the screen there. Um, it's generally a bit easier to operate as a branch rather than set up a local entity. Uh, your regulatory burden's a bit less. You haven't got to go through the rigmarole of setting up a, a French uh, SRL or a German GmbH or an American S Corp or Inc or LLC. They're all these, uh, you, you do also find when looking at overseas locations that whereas we have limited companies and we have PLCs, uh, many countries have a whole range of different types of entity some of which are regarded in a similar way to our limited companies, some of which are more like partnerships and some of which are a bit of both. Uh, and you have differences between how they're treated between different, country, different countries, which can cause all sorts of, of issues if you're not used to it. Um, it's relatively easily normally to turn a branch into a company later on. So if, for instance, you're anticipating losses in early years, uh, a branch might be attractive because those losses being part of your UK business, in effect, it's all one business, would be available to offset against UK profits, even though they're incurred in France. So. Uh, and at some point in the future, when that, when that business becomes a local French company, those losses may effectively be available again against French profits in the future. So uh, there are some reasons why using a branch might make sense. There are, of course, negatives as well. Um, quite often, one of the reasons for setting up overseas is because you, your, evidence, your information suggests that uh, French people, German people, whatever, prefer to buy from a French or a German company and not from somebody overseas, uh, from Britain or wherever. And so having the local presence could be an advantage. And you don't get as much of that with a branch compared to, say, a French company or a German company. Um, in reality, while the regulatory burden for a branch may be lower than having a, a local entity, a local company, uh, it may well be not that much different because, generally speaking, uh, a branch will be treated for most tax purposes as if it is a local company and you will have local tax issues. Um, PE, what am I talking about with PE? Well, I'm not talking about physical education, remember from school, I'm talking about permanent establishment. Um, when you set up an operation in a foreign country, which is anything other than very light touch, uh, let's say you've got, a, you've got a, an office there and you've got a number of employees there, you know, things are happening there, you're doing stuff in that country then you will probably have what's called a permanent establishment. And a permanent establishment uh, means you have a taxable presence in that country. And you can certainly have that without having a local company. So a branch will often give rise to a PE, which means you then need to uh, do French tax returns, say, for, for that, uh, that branch in France. Uh, and where you run into issues is your idea of what the profits related to the branch are may well be different to what the French government's idea of the profits relating to that branch are. And if you think about it, the tax rates in most European countries are quite a bit higher than the tax rates in the UK. So you in the UK have a distinct incentive to fix the pricing between your UK operation and your French operation such that the French side has very little, if any, profit. Uh, and there is a thing called transfer pricing, which looks to address that. Uh, and I'll say a bit more about that in a second. So branch versus entity, um, it's not an easy decision, but they're the main things that we'll be thinking about. So permanent establishment, I've, I've touched on already. What is it? Well, if you have a fixed place of business, usually involving bricks and mortar, to so see either rent or, or own uh, an office or a factory or, or a warehouse, whatever it may be, that uh, on, the, on, the, on the face of it could mean you have a permanent establishment. It probably will, as soon as you've got a fixed place of business there. Um, if you just have some local employees, but you don't have an office or a fixed place of business, and the employees operate from home, uh, under UK rules, that probably would not give you a local permanent establishment, um, unless those employees can bind the company but in contracts, which often they can't, of course, but if they could, then that might give you a PE. In many European countries, the rules are changing and quite often now you might find that having employees working from home could still give you a PE in that location. So you do have to be careful uh, that you don't stumble into having a PE without knowing about it. Um, if you just need to have a warehouse in, lo in a location to store goods before they go to your distributors uh, and then you pay people to be distributors for you, then that on its own doesn't necessarily need to be a PE. So you can have a presence in the location without having a PE. Uh, 
uh, and that might be good enough for you. So uh, bearing in mind, once you are trading in a, in a location, once you have a PE, whether it's a branch or a company, you've got all the costs and admin of dealing with the local authorities. Um, it's certainly worth considering whether you can get what you need without having that sort of presence, which is part of the process we would go through with you uh, in the advice stage before you set up overseas. Um, I've mentioned the next couple of bits. Now, the key thing with a PE is uh, you have to tax in that location or the local uh, authorities will seek to tax in that location the profits that relate to the activity of that permanent establishment. If it's not a local entity, they will look at the profits of your entire business and they'll say, OK, you've got a British company which has a branch in France. Uh, you're saying your profits are you know, negligible in France because of the way things are working, but we see you have huge profits in the UK they may well consider that your allocation of profits to France is, is being uh, fixed by the way you are choosing to price your, your products being moved between and your services being moved between the UK and France. Uh, and that's what brings us to the next slide, which is transfer pricing. Now, transfer pricing is the system whereby, uh, and there are all sorts of standards for doing this, uh, the OECD, Organisation for Economic Cooperation and Development, has set out a whole series of standard approaches to transfer pricing, which most um, developed countries will follow in one way or another, but there are differences. In essence, what we're trying to do here, what, it, what the intention between, with transfer pricing is, is to arrive at an arm's length price for all transactions between your UK operation and your overseas operation. Uh, and that's not just sale of goods and widgets and, and services, it's also the provision of finance uh, to, to the entity, uh, loans, etc., management support, marketing and sales support, all the back office stuff that the, uh, the main operation in the UK might be providing to a new local entity or, or branch. All those needed to be need to be priced as if it is transacting between third parties. Um, that may be straightforward in that there may be clear and obvious uh, means of arriving at what those fair arms length prices are, but often it isn't. Often you need to look at statistics and uh, big data sets and come up with very long and fairly complex and generally fairly expensive reports to prove that the prices you're using are indeed reasonable and arm's length uh, and following certain standard methods. So transfer pricing is something you have to think about. It, it may be in the early days it's not too important um, because it will be de minimis. Um, the UK certainly doesn't get too excited about very small operations uh, across border, but other states are not so forgiving um, and they don't have de minimis limits. So transfer pricing is always something to think about as soon as you are looking to do offshore business. So let's move on, please, James. Uh, you've been operating for a while and you're doing quite well. Let's say you've moved from the, the loss phase, if you did have one, you're now making money. At some point, you're going to want to take um, your profits, let's say, assume you have got them, out of your overseas location. Um, you will probably have provided support to that overseas entity in the form of, of capital, uh, share capital. Uh, you may well have made loans, you've probably done both. Uh, you may be providing IP. Uh, so your options for extracting funds include obviously dividends on your shares, uh, interest on loans, and potentially royalties on, on the use of IP, etc. Um, that all sounds straightforward, uh, but you then have to wonder, does the local uh, authority seek to withhold any tax on the payment by companies in its location to companies elsewhere? Um, and the answer is they generally do. Uh, now, pre-Brexit, when we were part of the EU, we were in, along with all the other EU states, what was called the Parent Subsidiary Directive, uh, and the parent subsidiary directive allowed payments of dividends, interest, royalties, etc., between uh, EU-based companies to be made without any withholding tax on, on any of those items. Obviously, we have now left the EU, uh, and that means that uh, we're not in the parent subsidiary directive. So, in principle, uh, the payment of a dividend from a French company, an Italian company, German company, to the UK may well have a withholding tax on it, equally payment of interest and royalties might. And the rules relating to those three different 
sources of income, again, can be different. Um, so that is something, and I'll just come on to another slide in a moment, which, which sets out some examples of that. Um, now, the good news is the UK has one of, if not the most extensive double tax treaty networks in the world. Um, and so we do, in fact, have treaties with all the major European countries, probably all of them, uh, although I haven't checked every single one of them. Um, and those treaties have rules that have been agreed, which often move the uh, withholding tax from the basic level, which can be quite unpleasant, it's often 15%, uh, to either a lower level or to a zero level. So if we just go to the next slide, I can look at some examples. Um, I just picked out a number of key European countries. Um, so France, they do have a withholding tax on dividends, but if you own more than 10% of the shares and the owner is a company in a in a treaty country, so let's say the UK, uh, your UK company owns your French subsidiary company and you own more than 10% of it, which you almost certainly will because you just set it up, uh, then they, uh, the, the withholding tax is reduced from the usual level to, to naught. Okay? And the French also do not charge withholding tax on interest or royalties in normal circumstances. Now, all of those things have to be caveated because the rules in the treaty are, are not as straightforward as it seems, but in essence, we're looking at a, you know, quite a good situation for, for France. Germany, um, there is a withholding tax there and it doesn't get down to zero, unfortunately. It, as long as you own more than 10%, you will have a 5% withholding tax on dividends. Uh, so that's worth bearing in mind, uh, but you don't have any, any, any withholding tax on interest or royalties. Italy is the worst one of this selection. Um, you've got a 5% withholding tax on dividends, even if you own more than 10%, but then you've got 10% on interest and 8% tax on royalties. So any of those flows of income to the UK from Italy would have those tax rates applied to them at least. Uh, the Netherlands is very good, uh, 0% all the way through there with similar reasons and Poland as you can see 0% on dividends but uh, little relatively low rates on interest and royalties. So what does this mean? Well we then start thinking of basic tax efficient structures uh, and this is the very very basic level obviously for, the, for this, this webinar just to give you an idea of the sorts of things that we can think about. Let's say you set up your subsidiary in Italy. That is where your business is. You've got to have your subsidiary there. Uh, I've just shown from the previous slide that if you take money out as dividends, you're going to have a 5% tax rate. You've got a 10% tax rate on interest and 8% on royalties. Now, they, they are taxes that are charged in Italy, um, and you don't necessarily get much relief for them in the UK. You might do, but either way, it's a cost which you can't avoid and which you'd like to avoid. Um, well, it may be possible to do so. Uh, let's say you set up a company in the Netherlands and it's the Netherlands company which owns your Italian subsidiary. So you have top company UK, uh, sub holding company Netherlands and then trading subsidiary in Italy. Um, the payment of dividends from Italy to the Netherlands, which is where they would go, um, payment of interest, payment of royalties in fact, from Italy to the Netherlands would be covered by the parent subsidiary directive because both countries are in the EU. The Netherlands could then pay a dividends or interest or royalties to the UK. Uh, and as we saw in the previous slide, uh, there is no withholding tax from the Netherlands. So we've managed to take the uh, otherwise taxable transaction from Italy to the UK and by routing it through the Netherlands, made it tax free. At least that's the plan. Uh, in the good old days, you could have a nameplate on a door in the Netherlands and that's all you needed. Uh, nowadays, uh, countries are a lot more uh, twitchy over the uh, use of such treaty shopping benefits, uh, deliberately picking countries to give you the best result. It can still be done, but you will need to have actual genuine substance of the operation in the Netherlands. So the Netherlands company would have to be doing something, probably have an employee or two and be active. But it is possible, obviously, to achieve that sort of, that sort of benefit. And just to finish off my bit, um, the UK has, as I mentioned earlier, very large tax treaty networks. We cover over 130 countries in the world. Pretty much all the main ones you come across uh, will have a treaty. I, I did some work with Uganda once, and we didn't at that time have a treaty with Uganda, although I think we might have now. Uh, so it does give you some extra problems when you run into a company without a treaty. But one of the early things you want to do when looking at and discussing with us or your advisors where you want to put your subsidiary is, is check the treaty situation. And then just to cover what we can do for you, obviously we are uh, MHA in the UK. Uh, we do, we're very good at UK tax. We don't claim to be experts in US or French or other taxes, although we do have some knowledge. But what we do have 
uh, bearing in mind we are the UK member firm of Baker Tilly International, which is a very large international network, and we are quite a senior member in that organisation. Uh, and that op our operation gives us access to local advice at, at a good level, uh, sometimes a very good level, in uh, over 148 countries around the world. So the chances are we will be able to get local support for you, and obviously we can advise you on how you set up in the first place. And at that point, I've gone on far too long. I shall hand you over to Jonathan to talk about VAT issues. Thank you, Patrick. Good morning, everyone. Uh, quick introduction, Jonathan Main. I'm a VAT and indirect taxes partner. Um, I stress the second bit uh, because uh, a part of the next few minutes will cover both VAT and customs duties because that's a that will be a key consideration for you, as you'll see in the following slides. So just thanks, James. Um, so as ground rules, I've called it. So the things to consider in terms of how you expand from the UK. Um, following on uh, from quite a lot of what Patrick's covered in terms of permanent establishment and um, also transfer pricing is relevant, as we'll get on to. Um, but in terms of whether you need an EU presence, absolutely not. Um, there can be advantages to having one, which I'll cover. But in terms of uh, holding stock, if you're supplying goods in the EU, because that's more efficient for some of the reasons I'll cover, um, no, you don't. Um, you can uh, simply uh, hold stock in an EU location and trade from that place with the remainder of the EU. Um, different path to follow for business to business compared to business to consumer, and I will cover that, and also different solutions and different issues to consider when trading goods compared to supplying services in terms of what presence you might wish to have uh, and what that presence could mean for your UK business in terms of uh, the way in which uh, VAT will arise, and as a result, the things that Patrick mentioned around corporation tax, uh, and also, also the things that James is going to cover on employment taxes. Um, and the final thing to mention, uh, in common with Patrick, I've used the EU as the most likely place that you might wish to expand to, but a lot, if not most, of the following points will apply equally in the considerations you'll need to think about if you're expanding somewhere outside the EU, within Europe or beyond Europe. Um, if you can move on, James, thank you. Uh, so trading in goods, business to business, is the place to begin is probably one of the more likely things that your business might be doing and might be thinking of um, taking its next step in terms of trading within the EU. Um, so the first thing to think about is, is what you're going to do um, uh, to start to hold stock for lots of very good reasons, which I'm about to cover, within the EU. And I've, I've used the example of a third-party logistics 3PL facility in the EU as um, quite a common first thing to do, in my experience, to make the fulfilment of orders for your European business customers an easier thing to manage than holding stock in the UK, given that we are no longer in the EU. Um, so one of the first things to think about uh, on this slide is the stock of UK or EU origin. Very common for supply chains that have built up over the years to involve the movement of raw materials between EU countries when we were one of those um, countries and for a processing to be undertaken in one place from raw materials manufactured somewhere else in the EU to make finished goods. None of that mattered, of course, in the past because we were all in a customs union and within a single market. Um, doing that now presents more challenges and can be a reason behind thinking, well, if I'm buying raw materials from my EU supplier who I've worked with for years, and I know that 50% of the finished goods from those raw materials will be sold to EU customers, might it be more efficient to retain that stock within the EU by using a manufacturing facility based there? 
and then a 3PL facility based there to fulfill those orders. Um, but almost irrespective of that point, it is, it is pretty crucial to make sure that the stock you're moving from the UK to the EU, if that's what you're going to do, um, can benefit from the free trade deal that was negotiated with the EU at the end of 2020. So make sure you've got your commodity codes right, that you understand what the goods are and that you understand what the rules of origin tests are, because they're not the same across the tariff. Um, they're different between clothing and machinery and computers. And it's, it's worth always making sure that you understand how they affect your business. Uh, moving on from that, Again, very common for goods to be sourced from the Far East. So let's use China as an example. If goods are coming from China to the UK and you now intend uh, a proportion of those goods to um, service your expanding EU footprint, then um, it's, it's not, a, not a good idea at all to bring those goods into the UK first from a duty perspective because let's say, pick a reasonably common duty rate of 6.5% on certain um, oh, goods used in house building, that sort of thing. Um, if they come in from China to the UK, well, you'll be used to paying that 6.5% when the goods come into the UK, um, but you won't expect to also have to pay a further 6.5%. Uh, when the goods go from the UK to the EU, it's that second movement um, that, that causes that to happen. And therefore, is it possible, and this is a financial consideration as much as anything else, to hold stock in two locations? Do you have a sophisticated enough um, stock management system, I suppose, to know that uh, three months worth of stock for my German customer base can be held in a German 3PL facility or a Dutch 3PL facility. And um, it would therefore make more sense for me to ship the, make that shipment directly from China to that Dutch facility and hold the stock there. And then you only get the one lot of 6.5% duty that you've been used to paying. Um, if you're shipping goods from the UK to your EU customers as a way of building your presence, market presence and awareness in the EU, think about something called INCO terms. INCO terms are the things that apply to the movement of goods uh, in terms of who takes responsibility for shipping them and um, also who is then named as the importer in the destination territory. Uh, and just quickly because of the time, uh, one end of the spectrum X works means your customer picks them up from your factory gate. Uh, and is responsible for everything from that point. The other end of the spectrum, delivered duty paid, DDP, means you take responsibility for the movement all the way to your customer's factory gate. And that critically means you are the importer. So um, the consequence of you being an impor importer and still therefore owning the goods in your customer's territory is that you would then have to register for VAT. Uh, a very common conversation with clients is avoid DDP at all costs if you can and think about the commercial relationship you have with the customer and how it could work differently to prevent that because that's a, a significant extra obligation for your business. Quickly, what are the benefits of a presence in the EU? There are lots of rules about the way in which you can import goods. Um, the benefits that you derive from free movement within a customs union that will accrue to an EU business, either branch or sub, that don't if you're not based within the EU. And bear in mind for those of you who do have um, business within Northern Ireland, a uh, presence there, the Northern Ireland is basically the 28th member state of the EU as far as goods are concerned. So that can work quite well too. Um, next slide, James, thank you. Uh, business to consumer is, is quite different um, and in ways that can trip you up. Uh, so if you are a, a B to C supplier of goods 
first thing and most critical thing, because everything flows from this really, is how are you fulfilling those orders? Do you have your own website? Are you using an online marketplace, so Amazon, for example? Or in fact, which a lot of people will do, do you use both? And uh, the consequence of the way in which you sell those goods and how they find their way to market in a fulfillment sense. Uh, so using Amazon as an example, it may, may well be the case that Amazon market them for you, but they don't take title to them. You're not a, I think it's called Amazon Central or something like that. You're not buying, you're not selling them to Amazon so that they can sell them in their own name. They're just fulfilling orders for you and advertising them on their own site. Um, if it's either of those cases, then the online marketplace, as I've said in the middle section of this slide, uh, takes responsibility for paying that tax on your behalf and therefore would pay you um, as the actual seller, if you want, the contractual seller would pay you uh, net of that VAT and obviously net of their own charges as well. Uh, and one point to bear in mind, which has been a common issue to overcome, uh, Amazon won't uh, import goods into the EU and will routinely insist that you um, have your goods in their warehouses to make the fulfillment of orders a smoother process, because obviously that's part of the attraction of using Amazon and Amazon Prime etc. So um, you will, if you wish to expand into EU markets in a retail sense and wish to use Amazon as a convenient way of doing that, will find that you have to start importing your goods into the EU. So we're back to that DDP point I mentioned, and therefore we'll end up with a registration liability um, in order to recover that VAT and, the, and um, in order to deal with the stock you're holding, even though Amazon will be paying the tax on your behalf, you may find actually it becomes simpler to set up some sort of presence in the EU and have a more reliable and simpler relationship with the tax authorities by being registered locally for let's say Dutch VAT, for example, and dealing with uh, Amazon within the EU from that location. Um, I've mentioned there's something called the import one-stop shop. Uh, and there's also something called the, uh, similarly called the one-stop shop for EU-based businesses. This is a mechanism to um, deal with the payment of tax. So if you're fulfilling orders throughout the EU, as that section says, the uh, sales are taxed now by reference to the place of consumption. So in simple terms, where the customer is based. So you could have liabilities to VAT in several member states of the EU as a consequence. To overcome the burden of having multiple VAT registrations, you would pick one member state to register. Uh, an example I've given would be the Netherlands because that's where you stored your goods and um, you would fill in a Dutch return, which conceptually has 27 boxes on it, and you would um, pay your tax um, through that mechanism, uh, calculating the tax due in each place at the respective VAT rates. So not easy, quite a lot to think about from a systems perspective uh, before you take that step in deciding to expand into the EU from a B2C perspective. The other option is to continue fulfill, to fulfill from the UK, but you're still going to have that requirement to complete that return, just not the extra burden of also having stock within the EU. So it depends on the size of business and the order you go through, I suppose, in, in, in working through how important is my EU business to me? Um, might it make sense to um, fulfill orders from the UK to start with? Then you move through perhaps to a 3PL facility that I've talked about. And then maybe you do get into a buy-sell structure. So effectively from the UK's perspective, you become a business to business supplier of goods to your Dutch subsidiary. Uh, next slide, please, James. Services, on the other hand, are, are, are 
more straightforward in that um, from a business to business perspective, a UK supplier of services to EU markets, if you haven't taken the step of setting up and having a presence within the EU, then um, you won't have an obligation to register for EU VAT because your customers would um, self-assess the VAT on your behalf uh, on the services that you deliver to them uh, if you stop short of having a permanent establishment. So for example, if you've got a short-term contract in an EU member state, you might send people over to provide architect services, for example, um, for a three or four month project. Uh, those people won't um, give you a requirement to register for VAT. I'd obviously defer to Patrick from a permanent establishment perspective, but may not from that perspective either. Um, and the VAT liability on your services will be dealt with by your customer through what in the UK is called the reverse charge, posting entries to each side of the VAT return, uh, dealing with what would otherwise be your obligation to charge local VAT on your services. Um, if you do go the next step of thinking, well, actually, this business in this country has got to a level where I do need boots on the ground, then um, you are moving towards the notion of having a permanent establishment because you've got, um, as that slide says, the human and technical resources, a VAT phrase from case law around how you end up with um, sufficient presence to trigger a, a fixed establishment from a VAT perspective, broadly the same as a PE, in terms of how the tests would work. Uh, you then got a PE and you therefore have a presence in the in the EU and would register for VAT at that point and will be treated as an EU business. Uh, finally, a couple of minutes left. Um, business to consumer has some similarity to B2C from a goods perspective in that um, you have an obligation, even if you're not based within the EU, to deal with uh, EU VAT to the extent that the services you supply are consumed within the EU. So again, in simple terms, where the customer is resident. So let's say you're providing um, uh, publications electronically to customers within the EU. The, uh, even though the rate of VAT on those in the UK would be at 0% within the EU, typically it isn't. Um, those electronic publications that you provide through your own website would be uh, taxed by reference to the member state in which your customer is based. Again, there's a one-stop shop process of uh, completing that return with the 27 boxes on it. Um, to account for VAT at the rate in force in the country in which your customer is resident. Uh, as the slide says, you get to choose in this case where the registration is held rather than it being driven by where your goods are being held, uh, the trading goods. Most people pick Ireland or the Netherlands and from that, most people pick Ireland. The Irish VAT system is very similar to the UK system. Obviously, common language helps, and that makes the processing of that return more straightforward. Um, with this and something I didn't mention um, on trading goods, these one-stop shop facilitation measures cannot be backdated. So if you're at the place now where you're thinking about moving to the EU, uh, do get this sorted um, as a first step. Otherwise you end up in a place where, uh, let's say in the worst examples, the, these changes came in from July last year, as the slide says, you end up with a need to register in a number of different um, territories around the EU, because you can't use the one-stop one shop retrospectively. So this is a good thing to think about in advance as you plan your expansion into the EU.
uh, with that, I'm finished, I believe. That's my last slide from memory. Uh, and so I can hand over to James. Thank you. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm going to finish up the final section of this webinar talking about employment issues. Um, famous last words, I'm going to try and keep this to there or thereabouts 10 minutes so as we can have some time for questions at the end. But uh, don't hold me to that. I'll do my best. Um, so, you know, what are we dealing with here? Well, in terms of employment issues, with overseas expansion, the first concern is likely to be how to employ people in the new country. In that case, of course, as Patrick said at the start, it's important to take local advice as early as possible. We can usually facilitate that through our international network, but we, of course, can only provide the UK advice. So I'll focus on that in this part of the webinar. Um, some of the issues I'll discuss are likely to be most relevant once the business is established overseas and there is a movement of staff between entities and jurisdictions. In that, in that case, the position can get quite complex um, from an employment taxes perspective. And there are a number of permutations or possible permutations as, as set out on the slide here. For example, you could have a UK employment which is undertaken both in the UK and overseas. And you could have the same position in reverse. Um, and there are differences between how employees and directors are treated. Um, and um, each of those permutations may be undertaken by a UK resident or a non-UK resident, which itself brings its own um, um, or separate um, implications, and whether those um, implications are in the UK or in the overseas jurisdiction. So you know, I suppose the overriding message here is that local advice needs to be taken and employers as early as possible need to consider their global and not just UK employment tax and social security um, obligations. And of course, although I won't cover any of this, any of this here, they, mustn't all, they must also not forget immigration and employment law um, issues um, and um, obligations. So on that note, um, the first thing, um, or rather from an, from an employer's perspective in the UK, the first consideration is whether there is an obligation to operate pay as you earn or PAYE. I'm sure you're, well, most of you are comfortable with PAYE obligations where you have UK resident individuals working solely in the UK. But what if, for example, you have employees who are now working outside the UK, perhaps for a connected overseas entity that you've, you've set up, or if there are employees who come to work for the UK entity and um, possibly from that um, connected overseas entity. Therefore, it probably goes without saying that to assist in determining the, the PAYE obligations, employers should keep, keep very, very good records and be able to identify and record which employees spend time working outside the UK, where they were working, for how long, and whether they were working for other group entities. Um, also identifying the employees of connected overseas entities who may undertake duties uh, for the benefit of the UK business. So when though is there an obligation to operate PAYE? Well at a, at a high level um, the employer firstly needs to have a sufficient presence in the UK to have an obligation to operate UK PAYE and a presence for this instance would be a branch or a permanent establishment or, or an office um, um, where HMRC can contact the employer. That will, of course, be the case for UK businesses looking to expand into the UK. But if employees are sent into the UK by an overseas entity, once you've expanded, then they may not have such a presence. Um, and the third, as, as the third point on the slide here says, in that case, the obligation to operate PAYE may move to the host employer, in this case, the UK entity, where the individual works for the benefit of that other entity in the UK, even though they're not the legal employer, and even if they don't pay the employee directly. Um, just as I suppose, and as, as an aside here, employers should also consider the UK residents' position of employees who are working overseas. Um, but practically, you know, UK employers will take a prudent approach and assume that those who go overseas um, you know, temporarily will um, usually remain UK resident. Now the residence position, and this is this slide's about um, treaty relief, so referring to our double tax treaties, but the, 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 the residence position is relevant when considering whether relief is available 
under under any um, uh, applicable double tax treaty, and in particular the, the dependent personal services article um, of those double tax treaties between the UK and, and other jurisdictions. Now, um, these articles um, are typically set out um, as on the slide here. I've, I've just included the OECD model treaty um, um, dependent personal services article rather than any particular um, specific um, treaty that the UK has with another jurisdiction. Um, but the key point being paragraph one, which says employment income may be taxed in the country in which the duties are carried out and will also be taxable in the um, country in which the individual is resident. So what does this mean? Well, if an individual is resident in the UK, um, for example, but undertakes duties in, say, Ireland, those Irish duties may be taxable there, but they will also be taxable in the UK. Um, and the PAYE obligations will follow, i.e. there will be obligations in both countries, okay, for the employer to consider. Um, paragraph two, um, so the, the bottom section of the, the um, model treaty here is, is perhaps a, a little more complex, but um, consider this in the context of someone coming to the UK. So if someone comes to work in the UK for less than half the year, that's 183 days, and their remuneration is paid by an overseas entity, so perhaps the overseas entity that you've set up, um, um, but and that overseas entity does not have a presence in the UK, um, treaty relief may be available so that the individual's income is only taxable in the country in which they are resident. In other words, not in the UK. So what does this mean from a PAYE perspective? Well, um, um, whether or not treaty relief is available, the starting point is that PAYE obligations exist where, where work is undertaken in the UK. Um, but in the situation as explained in paragraph two um, of the previous slide, <coughs> the UK company as the host employer would ordinarily have an obligation to operate PAYE, but recognizing that treaty relief may be available, it's possible to apply for um, what we call a short-term business visitor agreement, or as on the slide here, an Appendix 4 agreement, as it's otherwise known, to remove the obligation to operate PAYE um, obligations where um, uh, the, the, the conditions set out on this slide are met. Um, basically, and just to read off the slide, essentially, um, that is that the individual is resident in a country in which the UK has a double tax agreement where the income is likely to be exempt, uh, the individual is coming to work in the UK for a UK company or UK branch of an overseas company, or they are legal employed, legally employed by a UK resident employer, but economically employed by a non-resident entity, come on to economic employment, and they're expected to stay in the UK for less than half the year in any 12-month in any period. Um, if individuals are in the UK for 60 days or more, um, uh, it must be confirmed that the UK company or branch will not bear the remuneration specified, i.e. the UK company does not become that economic employer. If they do, there would be a PAYE obligation. Um, that's the um, social, that's the so-called economic employer, which generally applies where costs are recharged internally between, between group entities. Um, but as you can see that the, these Appendix 4 agreements can simplify, can simplify the operation of PAYE where there are kind of in short term international assignments. Um, where, and this is coming on to sort of PAYE reliefs, if you like, where, where there is a PAYE, or PAYE obligation on the employer, there may be um, um, uh, reliefs available which can apply. Um, and to apply these, we'd need to understand the resident status of the employees themselves and the implications of that status. So, um, firstly, UK resident individuals are taxable on their worldwide income, whereas non-UK resident individuals are only taxable on earnings related to substantive duties performed in the UK. So what's the first relief here? Well, the first one I've listed here is the so-called Appendix 5 agreement, otherwise known as the Net of Foreign Tax Credit Relief Agreement. So to put this into an example, take a situation where um, there's a UK resident individual who undertakes duties for the UK employer, but in another country, Ireland, for example. They may be liable to tax in Ireland on that Irish income, 
and the employer will have an obligation to operate Irish PAYE in a similar manner as in the UK. The employer will also have an obligation to operate PAYE in the UK on their entire earnings as they remain UK resident. But we know the employee will eventually be able to claim foreign tax credit relief for the Irish tax against their UK tax liability. Now, the, the, the Appendix 5 agreement allows the employer to take account of the Irish tax in calculating the UK tax so that the employee is not temporarily out of pocket by paying tax in both jurisdictions and then having to sort it out under self-assessment um, following the end of the year. So administratively and, and, and in terms of keeping employees happy, that's a very, very important relief. Um, there's also what we call the Section 690 determination, um, which can apply where, um, firstly, a non-resident or non-resident individual undertakes duties in the UK and elsewhere. Now, um, um, the 690 determination allows us to agree with HMRC a proportion of overall earnings that are liable to PAY in the UK based on their UK work days. In other words, rather than applying PAYE to their, 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 their whole remuneration, we can agree with HMRC what amount relates to UK work and because they're non-resident, that's the only bit that's taxable and therefore that's the bit that we will subject to UK PAYE. Um, secondly, where this is relevant is in the first three years of an individual being resident in, the, or rather a non-UK domiciled individual being resident in the UK, they can qualify for what's called overseas workday relief whereby remun their remuneration for duties performed outside the UK, even though they are resident here, um, is not taxable in the UK, provided that remuneration is not remitted to the UK. Now, this is where it gets a little bit complex, but a new offshore bank account should be set up at the beginning of the assignment and each tax year um, um, into which the um, remuneration is paid. Um, and the 690 determination will then allow us to agree with HMRC the element of the overall remuneration that qualifies for overseas workdays relief and is therefore not liable to PAYE in the UK. So you can see with all these, with all these different permutations, it's, it's, it's so important to consider the position before we get going and agree, agree these reliefs with HMRC before we really get going. Um, Moving on to the next slide, just to cover directors. Well, I've, I've focused on employees, um, and I suppose in summary, similar provisions apply for directors. All I would add in relation to this slide is that non-UK resident directors of UK companies who are visiting the UK to perform duties um, 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 uh, would be subject to PAYE on their salaries or fees paid to them, even if they only spend a single day in the UK. Often double tax treaties don't offer the same protection uh, for directors um, as they do for employees. So in this case, it might be even more important that we consider a 690 determination for UK work days. And it's also important to note that the short term business visitor or stroke appendix four agreement um, can't be used for directors. Um, I'm running very, very short of time. I'm going to cover the next slide and then perhaps stop. Um, and in, in, in this slide, I just introduced the concept of what we call tax equalization. So how do I explain this? Um, if, if an individual is seconded to work overseas, for example, their tax position may be materially affected by um, the different tax regime that applies in that overseas country. And I suppose that position um, applies equally when someone comes to work in the UK, their UK tax exposure might be significantly different to what it would be if they remained in their, in their, in their local jurisdiction. So tax equalisation in the UK is an arrangement between an employer um, and an employee who is a foreign national and comes to the UK to work in the UK, where, as listed on the slide here, the terms of the agreement um, are such that the employee is entitled to receive a spec or specified net cash earnings um, and the employer undertakes to meet the UK income tax liability arising um, from those earnings and the employer also agrees to ensure that the employee's tax affairs will be handled by a professional tax advisor or an in-house tax specialist. The employer basically operates pay-as-you-earn or PAYE on a 
gross up basis to ensure that after UK tax deductions, the employee receives the agreed net of tax income um, and the employer is responsible um, for the tax liabilities arising and indeed any residual tax liability um, that might arise under self-assessment in the UK. Now I'm gonna bring talk to a close. I did have a final slide on um, social, social security contributions or national insurance. Um, I was only covering EU and the position pre and post Brexit. The slide is pretty, is pretty um, detailed and, and, and covers the position. And of course, there are further um, considerations for um, um, non-EU or non-EEA non um, countries, which we can advise on um, where necessary. But as we have a couple of minutes of the hour remaining, um, we should probably stop for any questions that have popped up during um, during the talk. Uh, thank Thanks, you, James. Uh, to Steve, are there are there some questions? There are, uh, most of which um, I've batted off. Uh, you'll be pleased to know. Um, there was one which actually you might prefer to answer, uh, Patrick, because it uh, gives you an opportunity to give your usual salutary warning. Uh, and there have been a couple of questions about um, LLCs in the US and using them as an entity if you wish to expand in the US. Yeah, OK. Well, I mean, I, I mentioned at the start um, that there are often many different entities available in different locations. And the US is a classic example. O over there, you can have uh, a limited company, which uh, is, is often treated as a, as a partnership. You can have a limited liability company, which the Americans treat as either a corporation or as a partnership, but we treat as a corporation. You can have an S corporation, which we do treat as a company, and so do the Americans, at least normally, and you can have an incorporated, and there's probably a few others. Um, and LLC is one that's particularly problematic. It's very common to use an LLC in the US for all sorts of reasons. Generally, but not always, uh, the US users, uh, the US resident users of an LLC will be using it because they want to have it taxed as if it's a partnership. So profits go straight through to the individual members, in other words. Uh, the UK government, however, takes the view in virtually all circumstances that an LLC is a limited company uh, and we treat it as such. So what does that mean? Um, well, it might not mean anything, but where you have cross-border transactions, uh, and in particular, we, particularly where a UK resident individual is owning something via an LLC in the US, uh, it can lead to all sorts of nasty tax consequences. Uh, as far as the US is concerned, the UK individual is taxed on, on his or her share of the profits of that entity. But as far as the UK is concerned, uh, whenever they receive money from that entity, it's a dividend paid by that company, because we treat it as a company. Uh, what that means is tax paid by the individual on distributions that might have been allocated to him or her in the US um, are not allowable against the tax we would look to charge on what we regard as a dividend received from that US entity, because it's paid by a different person for a different reason. Uh, and that can cause all sorts of issues. So whenever I hear of UK investors using LLCs, uh, I, I get a bit queasy and we try and think of another way around it uh, because it, it does often cause us real problems. H having said all that, um, there is at least one court case which showed that on occasion an LLC can be regarded as a transparent entity, i.e. like a partnership. Um, and so it is actually very, very complex and there's no definitive answer on it, which is, which is why we, we get queasy. As I say, uh, LLCs in the UK uh, are, tend to be tend to be a bit of a problem, if that answers the question. Um, yes, thank you. Uh, I have a few more. Uh, I can carry on, or I realise we've reached 11 o'clock. If you'd prefer to stop, we can stop. Well, I appreciate people have to go. Um, we have got to this stage before. I, I mean, I'm, I, I think let's do, let's do another, another question. Uh, and then apologies for those who won't be answering. Uh, we will try and answer them separately. But if people are willing to hang on for a minute while we answer one more question, that would be great. Right, excellent. Okay, I have one here um, which concerns an employee working remotely overseas and living overseas for a UK company uh, and paying UK tax but continuing to reside overseas. Uh, the employee has a right to work in the UK and, and is also a dual citizen. Is that okay? Yeah, I will start and I will see anyone else jump in, but um, if they are um, non-UK resident, then um, 
they will not be undertaking any duties in the UK in respect of their employment for UK employer. So I would have thought that um, one way or another, um, we should get to a situation where they're not paying UK tax and are um, hopefully not um, paying tax under PAYE. And although if they do, it could be recoverable. Um, is that a... Is that, I think that probably answers it. And then it I, think, I think it, it needs to be looked at um, yeah. quite carefully, is the answer. Yeah, I think it's it's a bit more tricky these days, isn't it? Because it's, uh, I mean, for instance, in our line of work, where we found out over lockdown that we can do the, the vast majority of what we do from, from home, uh, as we have had to do, uh, as, along with other people, um, it'd be perfectly possible, in theory, for me to do what I do from a sunny beach in Barbados. Uh, mm. or, or some other nice location, possibly where there is very little or no local taxation. I could become a resident there, but carry on otherwise operating as I have been remotely from my home in wherever it was. I don't think the UK would be particularly keen on not taxing me on my income from the UK. If, if as a matter of fact, you're not UK resident and you're not, not stepping foot in the UK, um, you know, that's where well, it obviously needs to be looked at. But certainly there's yeah, been enough... It, 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 number of cases where people have become stranded, you know, around the world and their tax position has been materially affected, um, particularly during the COVID period. Yeah, I think that, I think the point is with, with modern communications, uh, the mm. digital world, as we're finding in all sorts of areas, uh, the tax system hasn't really kept up uh, and we can expect yeah. there to be some issues, um, some issues there. But, but clearly the UK yeah. wouldn't be particularly pleased if vast numbers of its employees went and lived in a tax haven. And providing yeah. their services and claim they were not were, were not taxable here, and um, that, that's that's not going to be sustainable, is it? So, quite how it works is is difficult, and I think uh, we've all said yeah, it, it needs to be looked at and thought about very carefully. Agreed. Uh, well, thank you very much, everyone. Sorry we haven't dealt with quite all the questions. I hope that was useful. Uh, as usual, anything further occurs to you, then please fire an email into us, and we'll try and answer it. The slides, uh, as I think Deepa has said, will be available shortly via the website. Uh, and good to see you all and I look forward to uh, seeing you on the, the next one in about a month's time. Thank you very much.